Let's go. Right, so uh, thank you so much for coming once again. Is it just me or does too many people feel like a uh, couple hours ago since my last talk? Uh, <laughs> seems about a year ago. Doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so once again, thank you so much for you know joining me. Pete, good to see you again. So good, Tom. Yeah, great to see you again. Great. Hello. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Hello. So, <laughs> so you know, let's go straight into it. So, two made of four. January 1999. What do you first remember of Tomb Raider 4 during that time? Um, well, I think you mentioned Grundy's, didn't you? Uh, did you? So Grundy was, is the pub over the road from Core Design. Did we start formulating concepts for it over there? Or? I, think, I think probably it's the beginning of that, sure. Um, I, think, oops, I think a lot of what we're talking about is how we're going to make a, a linear game again rather than the sort of non-linear two mode three. Right. Okay. So a, a story that we'd tie it all together. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, Jay's um, basically told us that we, we, we'd start putting together the ideas that we had for five that we were going to use for four. So we had like um, the island level and yeah. I think we were sort of discussing what became five uh, and Jay's telling me Heath Smith uh, basically said, you're doing Egypt. Um, so, and he's quite right in a way, because I think the Tomb Raider fans, you, know, you guys wanted to see Lara in, in Tombs again, as yeah. opposed to London, perhaps, but yeah. Okay, so Egypt was just decided really early on during the movies. Yeah, Jez yeah. said, you, well, actually, we were gonna, I forgot, actually, we were going to go to Egypt. Jez um, was, was going to send us all to Egypt. Okay. Um, but... It, I think we found out that the, um, the amount of time for the injections to take effect took six weeks, so he was like, no well, fucking way. Yeah, no, no chance, you're not going to, uh, not having six weeks off work. So, uh, so yeah, no, we had to, we, so we took a big trip down to London, went to the British Museum, um, and the, you know, the street opposite, it has thousands of, of uh, historic booksellers, um, so we went into there, and this was before you could download texts off the internet. So we each bought, you know, like 90 books, and, um, and then we just scanned, used the scanner to scan all the textures in. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, you, you just couldn't basically, you, you couldn't get anything else into that, that stage, could you? So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, fair enough. So I imagine that like, when Egypt was decided upon, I mean, and this is a question for each of you, really, did you each have, like, maybe a name that you wanted to do in the fourth game that you really didn't have time to do in the third game, or maybe something you wanted to perhaps refine from before? I think for say like the CG cinematic side of things, the technology just moved very, very quickly yeah. and we just wanted more time and more people as we realised we were very overstretched on the earlier games. So more production planning and trying to just boost the overall quality. So a lot of my early work was, was planning what we we're going to do, it was storyboarding things, it was doing concept art with a view to handing the work over to a wider team. Mm. So I think that was a big part of it, but really a lot of it was just how we introduce a story and having these um, story characters. That was the big thing mm. with Von Croy and John Eves. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, I've sort of talked, when we talked about Tomb Raider 3, I think um, having played Tomb Raider 1 and 2 as a player, a big part of Tomb Raider 3 was trying to get rid of all of the exploits that players typically had where they knew they could just stand on top of a rock and shoot things. Um, and I think I kind of carried on with that with Tomb Raider 4. And so the, the big thing with Tomb Raider 4 was trying to get enemies that could actually follow Lara anywhere, like the ninjas and the skeletons. So that was a, a, a really a big part of it, trying to just, uh, yeah, and I could go on about that for hours, but I, I will not. We could do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And I think a big part of Tomato Four, like you said, Pete, as well, is a story. I mean, a story, I just think, is just fantastic, really. And it follows all these beats. And I mean, Andy, I mean, you were involved in you know, writing the scripts and yeah. uh, Rich Morton as well. Like, but was it like a, t like a collaborative effort to have a story? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, so we all sat for about two weeks, I think, around a, a table, a meeting room table upstairs, and kind of went through. The, the plot beats, the story beats, um, and because it had kind of been dropped on us with Jay saying um, create Egypt, we we basically stole the plot beats from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. Um, <laughs> kind of quite easy. So uh, Belloc, you know, became Von Croy, um, all those 
Tom calls him <laughs> beast in bun high. Um, but yeah, so you know, we, we, we kind of looked at, at Raiders, um, but we all love Raiders, and we kind of looked at the plot structure and kind of tried to hit the beats um, to some degree of that film. Uh, and yeah, and you know, really it's kind of from that point on, we have to decide on levels uh, with regards how, which areas we were going to look at um, in Egypt, mm. you know. Um, so I wanted to make a horror game, so I usually do. Um, but I think, you know, we, we kind of structured it around getting to the pyramid at the end, because obviously, you know, you want that to be the big finale. Mm. Was that the last level, the pyramid? Mm. Like stealing horror, um, yeah, scenes, so, yeah. yeah. But I think a big part as well, I mean, you mentioned about Indiana Jones. I mean, with a story which you got young Lara, I mean, the title's called Last Revelation, so I imagine mm. maybe Last Crusade, that was maybe related. Well, yeah, we, this is something that used to get on our, on our week quite frequently, is that um, whenever we sent any uh, titles to the marketing department, um, it didn't matter what we sent the pages of titles, um, and, you know, names, sub subheadings for Tomb Raider, um, and they would always choose one word out of the latest in John Jones film. So in this case, it was, um, was it the revelation or was it the last, last bit? But yeah, yeah the last bit. Um, so it didn't matter what we put, so we just knew you know, that they were gonna, gonna just put the last something or, um, or, or something crusade mm -hmm. or, um, but uh, yeah, so that kind of got on our wick. Um, but it didn't matter what we put, did it? But, yeah. <laughs> but we used to always try and slip some stupid names in there, but, um, not too stupid because I probably wouldn't use them. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, fair enough. I think I'm just following on that, Pete. I mean, you, know, you said about the FMV, and there's a big part of the story as well. And there's a lot of FMV compared to Team Raider 3 this time. And I mean, really, like, was like, was that on purpose? Was that more a focus to focus on the story through FMVs and kind of seeing how the story went? I think so. Yeah, we wanted. I think having a, a single location made a lot of sense. And as Andy said, you know it's an obvious shoe in that everyone understands there are tombs in, in Egypt and you don't need to travel far yeah. to have that connected store which is very much like in Raiders where they're digging in different sites and, and mm -hmm. things like that. So I think that was a really strong aspect of it but then um, bringing in other key characters and trying to have that story arc was important but also I think we were trying to tell a more coherent story so Tomb Raider 3 it had a good story but it was very much a bookend. Mm -hmm. you, got a bit of the beginning and then you got a bit of the end and there wasn't a huge amount in between. I think we wanted a, a, like an evolving narrative throughout the game. Um, and you've got the plenty of Tomb Raider, like Tomb Raider 1 style, like the flashback to Atlantis, we had flashbacks and things like that. And I think mm. that was an important part of it. And certainly when we did the voice acting as well as getting um, the voices of set and things like that, mm. it was a really cool part of it as well. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. And I imagine as well, because, you know, it was the slightly different team this time as well, because, you know, Nathan McCree wasn't doing the music anymore, um, and, and Janelle was voicing Lara this time. So imagine as well, there's kind of almost like a different feel as well, like making Tomb Raider 4, like compared to 3, in a sense. Yeah, we, I think we always thought Tomb Raider 4 was our best Tomb Raider, you know, we all, we all kind of knew what we were doing. Um, in a way, it's kind of nice that we that Jez took the responsibility of the um, where we were setting it away from us because then we had to really focus on researching. Mm. Um, you know, so I mean, my research involved lots of stupid books by Graham Hancock and other sort of pseudo um, scientific uh, writers about you know aliens, you know, spawning, um, you know, the people that made the pyramids and what have you, uh, which is very important for a Tomb Raider game. Yeah. There's at least some sort of stupid um, uh, backstory to it. So, um, you know, that was my research on holiday was, you know, just reading through kind of weird books about, um, about Egyptian mythology. But we did get Kieran on board, who, I don't know if you want to talk about that a bit, Tom? Uh, yeah, I mean, just just uh, before going to work a core on Tomb Raider, I, I taught at Nottingham University, and one of my, my, my best friend there was a guy called Kieran O'Hara, who's kind of a serious academic, um, working in AI, but also an Egyptologist. So basically, it was when we started doing this storyline about Egypt, I sort of said to him, you know, can you help me with this, come up with some ideas, or make sure we're doing things which are kind of, you know, authentic as much as they can be. And um, he helped with some of the early drafts of the story. 
And um, as Andy said, at one stage um, in the first draft, um, Von Croy was known as Beeston Van Heyer, which is a joke that only really works if you live in Nottingham. Um, but uh, yeah, so Kieran helped out, helped out with that early on, so it was, it was kind of nice to get his involvement in there. And the, the funny thing is, is even though he is still a serious academic and writer, um, people go up to him in conferences, and the thing he is best known for is having worked on the Tomb Raider 4 story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. And of course, you know, I can't really talk about the story unless you know, mentioning the ending. You know, um, spoilers mm. for anyone who hasn't played too much before. Um, but Lara does become a trap of sorts, you know, at the end of the game. So, was that always the plan with Tomb Raider Four at, at Grundy's in January? Or how did that no, I think out? we did it. Uh, um, we, we did it in the meetings um, with regards. We we thought it was funny. Um, we were just really irritated with, with, with Lara for you know two years at that point. Um, but it was it was a team decision, um, and I think you know we yeah we kind of we we thought because really management didn't get too involved with the plots uh, with the scripts, which is you know really insane to think about with current game development. Um, but yeah, the, you know Adrian and Jez wouldn't really read the scripts, um, and so we knew we'd kind of get away with it until you know <laughs> everything started. So um, I do remember I've got a very big memory of Jess taking us in and shouting at us quite a lot. Yeah. Um, that was quite a regular occurrence. Though, wait, yeah, so they might, just, they might have all blurred together, but I remember him saying, what do you think you're doing, you stupid twat? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, uh, but we, we, I think we knew, because we feared we may also be killed uh, by Jess, that um, we kept it kind of open-ended so that we didn't see a you know, <laughs> mould under the pyramid. But, um, but I mean, it's quite, it was, you know, it's quite emotional, certainly with Pete's work on it. Um, you know, I do remember seeing that and, and, and kind of welling up uh, with the music and the, you know, yeah, yeah. With, the, with Pete, Pete's music and your F&B, you know. It's really emotional sequence. Yeah. Um, but also I think it was kind of closure for us. We felt like we'd yeah. got rid of the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's certainly an ending that requ- an ending that um, required a sequel, which we knew was inevitable anyway. Yeah. So at least c- keeping people waiting. Yeah. Was, was good, rather than just Laura walks off into the sunset. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. So just can I move on to the gameplay now? So I mean, first of all, like as soon as you start the game, um, the ring's gone. You've got a title screen. You go straight into uh, the train level. So there's no more Laura's home. And instead, you are following Von Croy. Um, so I apologise about this time for bringing this up. Um, but the question really is: like, what led to the decision of like not having Laura's home anymore? And how come these levels weren't skippable for like experienced players, just in case? And your experiences of Von Croy. <laughs> Do you want to talk about any? Shall I talk about this or do you want to? Tom, you talk. You can talk about it. You need to get it out. Okay, I'll try. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll talk about them, and you can talk to me for bits I get wrong. So, I think we thought that the Tomb Raider Three um, Croft Mansion was pretty much as good as we could get, and it felt like that was you know good, and we didn't need to do that again because you know just do the same thing again. So also, you know, uh, we felt that in actual fact having um, Von Croy and young Lara at the beginning gave you that kind of context for later on. So obviously, you know, Von Croy would have no kind of emotional resonance later if you hadn't had that kind of um, him being your mentor early on. So that's another reason why it wasn't skippable, mm-hmm. um, was that you, you know, we felt that everyone needed to go through that story. Now in theory, the, you know, the, that, um, I guess you'd call it Fatui nowadays, um, that first time user experience, that training level should have been a a fun thing for everyone to run through. If you were an experienced player, you know, you should be able to just get straight through it easily. But here's, here's the thing. Basically, uh, this was the nearest I came to having a nervous breakdown in the <laughs> entire three years of working on Tomb Raider. Um, uh, like I said, the whole thing with Tomb Raider 4 is that enemies could do the same thing that Lara could do, um, and that meant Von Croy. So the whole intention was that Von Croy would show you the moves and you would repeat them, and that was a training experience. Um, but basically, I would do design this, um, give it to QA, and they would break it within half an hour. And so I would fix it, and then give it back to them, and then they'd break it again. Because the thing is that, um, 
uh, forgive me, players are bastards. So uh, <laughs> they will, you know, in, you think that this is the way that someone will treat a level and that they will follow Von Croy and does whatever, do whatever he does. But of course, someone who's played the game before, the first thing you do is sprint past the old man and kind of go to the shimmy bars, which then means you're now in the shimmy position that Von Croy is trying to jump to. And so Von Croy will jump to the same position you are and you've got this horrible thing where Von Croy and Lara are smashed into the same player position. So that, that was basically happening all the way through the tutorial and I kept on trying to fix it, I kept on trying to fix it and I think after maybe two or three months where I was genuinely going mad, I think it was Gibby, God bless him, I think it was Gibby who just said, mate, just, just let it go and so that's why we've got this kind of horrible fix which was to basically have Von Croy stop in every 30 seconds giving you a bit of dialogue because then we could reset the tutorial to Von Croy's new position. You don't really, no, you don't, I, I looked at it the other day, and you, it's not bad from... from well, no, <laughs> I mean, you don't really notice the... You know, it's not quite as jarring as you think it is. I, I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think if you were a new player who was actually kind of doing it as intended, it probably works okay. But if you're an experienced player, I mean, I think it's just incredibly frustrating. I mean, I genuinely, I watched the video before coming here, because I always do that when we do these things, because I've forgotten everything about the game. And I watched a video of it, and I was just like getting PTSD just watching it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yes, right. If you want to, if you want to actually give Tom a nervous breakdown, we need to get Sophia Lee. The, we saw the cosplay lady earlier, earlier. Yeah. And uh, Von Von Croy, Croy, the in, uh, yeah. cosplay in the same room. <laughs> Between and immediately just collapse and die. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but no, um, one of the other reasons we did uh, we actually did that. Um, sequence which I think we have forgotten which I just remembered when you were talking is because obviously we nicked it off the start of the, the last crusade where um, we thought young indie, young yes. Lara um, let's introduce you know um, a kind of introductory sequence um, so you know the, the Raiders films were a big in, uh, inspiration for us yeah. great no that's great so I imagine like maybe compared to Von Croy like the guide in the other level and um, how was that like to design was that uh, I mean so I the guide was, I think, one of the first things I did when we were making the game, when we were making Tomb Raider 4. So basically, once I got the... It was taking some of the stuff we'd done for Area 51, like the guards in the previous, in Tomb Raider 3, and using some of those kind of instruction, AI instructions to do particular things. And um, I was actually really proud of that level. I really liked that intro when you're kind of walking down into the caves and he's lighting the way. And I feel it, it felt quite epic, you know, really nice music. It felt kind of quite epic, that sequence. I mean, again, totally ripped off at the start of um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, really, with having the guides taking you through down into the caves. But I, I really genuinely, I, I loved that level at the start of, of, of Tomb 4, um, after, the, after the tutorial levels. Mm. But yeah, with the guides showing you the way was um, one, of the, one of the things I'm quite proud of. Amazing. No, amazing. And Andy, so you were involved in the Cairo levels, yeah? <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and it starts, you know, with... Um, Guns blazing, motorbikes as well. So mm. I imagine that was kind of taken from Last Crusade as well, because there is a motorbike sequence too. Yeah, I mean, I haven't actually seen that. Um, I was meant to watch the video of the title, uh, but I didn't. Um, so I haven't seen that sequence for years, but I do remember, um, so I built that entire level around the motorbike, um, and I was trying to make a haunted city, kind of, uh, because I realised I couldn't, in Cairo, there's a thing called the City of the Dead, uh, which is a massive graveyard, which is inside of the pyramids. So I thought, you know, perfect, this is amazing. But I realised that obviously graveyards aren't usually gigantic cubes, um, so I couldn't build enough actual static mesh graves because the poly count would have been so enormous it would have stopped the machine sure. immediately. So I thought, right, I'd just have to make it in an empty city. But um, so basically, that whole city was designed um, around driving that motorbike and doing jumps and such like. And one of the the jumps crossed between loads, level loads, you know, so you load, you jumped over a, a, a pit and then it loaded the next part of the level. So I can remember saying to Chris, uh, one of our coders, I don't think he's been to one of these, but it, we, yeah, it's a shame we haven't because you enjoy Chris. Um, but anyway, so Chris, uh, I said to Chris, so it needs to, you need to jump and then, you know, we load the other level and then I was going to land on the other, other side and he said, well, you can't fucking do that. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's like the entire levels are based around, you know, jumping between these things. He says, no, I can't do it. Uh, and I was like, you, can you try to do it? He's like, no. Um, so, uh, so went home, obviously, uh, I probably went to the pub. Um, and, uh, you know, just thought, oh, Christ, I've got to redesign the whole of that kind of level. Um, came back in the next morning, he was like, he says, I says, I, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's like a really, I think it was a really difficult piece of code, wasn't it? Yeah, that yeah, it's yeah. storing the position of, a, uh, yeah. of an object at that point between levels, and you know, but he, and he just went, yeah, it just did it. Um, but he always used to try and scare the crap out of you. And <laughs> 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 but no, so that was nice that he, you know, we had such a strong team, as I've said before. Yeah, um, yeah, no, definitely. I think one thing you mentioned actually I want to pick up on is the fact that you know, jumping between levels, I mean, that was something that was new in Tomb Raider because it wasn't just like you reach the end of a level, you got your statistics, and then you got a loading screen that maybe relates to the location. This time, it was all kind of like going back and forth, almost like a hub. I mean, was that intentional to have a hub? Well, I've heard that um, it gives people nightmares. Um, part of with the, I used to be obsessed with backtracking. Okay. Um, I used to think you needed to get your money's worth uh, from a level design perspective, and I think um, even Pete said downstairs about ten minutes ago, he said, "It's the yeah, stuff the bloody backtracking, isn't it?" Um, so you just basically go back over yourself again and again and again. Um, but I mean, one thing that I that I always did enjoy, and I think I did well, is the mood of the levels. I always think I got a kind of um, kind of spooky feeling. Um, but yeah, no, it, um, I don't think it was good level design. Me making the player crisscross back and forth across levels. Um, so no. Okay, right. <laughs> Fine. And Pete, I mean, the thing is, like, with um, so about a quarter into the game, uh, we come across a character called Johnny's. And there seemed to be something that kind of happened really there. Um, do you want to talk to us about that? <laughs> <laughs> There's a specific ac aspect of that that you were thinking of. Now. Okay, well, I suppose when he was first introduced um, with, so Pete Duncan and Andy, in fact, it was Pete who spoke to me more about it, was um, this is sort of almost like a, an advisor to Lara, but there was some sort of thought about whether he could also be like a potential love interest. And then I sort of drew a version of him that was like that. And then it was just like, no, make him like an old man or an older man. It's like, okay, we've, we've moved, that's the story did at that stage. It was quite malleable and we went, no, we don't want that connection. And um, so obviously there was a real person involved. Um, and the, the, but we, you know, we weren't realistically setting out to aim on it. And, and anyone who's looked at, say, our, our, our ultimate boss at the time, Jeremy E. Smith, would realise that John Eves looks a lot like him. And in fact, I did have one of my first renders of him. I actually called it Jez Eves. <laughs> but um, so the, there was that aspect of it. And then we, we started to build up you know, the world where he lived. So he would have a home. And we're trying to get, make these characters a bit more have a bit more depth to them so they're not just someone that you turn up you met him multiple times so you got to see his house you got to see where he worked in his office and just prior to Andy's level in Cairo you go there and there's a knife and mm. a note and things like that so we tried to build all this stuff up in there but we also you know doing all these things a little bit in isolation in a bubble um, we we had a, an asset pack of some models where we get things like helicopters and cars and things like that, things like Von Croy's Buick. We change it around a bit and we, we had helicopters that appeared in the Cairo F&B from there. And then one of them, we just found this chair called Egypt chair. And we thought, oh, this is fantastic. We'll use that. It's from a museum. And it was a 3D scan of a, an actual chair. Um, obviously, come the time of Team Raider 5, um, the real John Eves um, had been made aware of of the game and um, happened to have a chair like that and then at that point it felt like you know there was a legal case to sort of say that obviously we'd probably spy through the window of his oh, office. Did, and did it not look, look like him as well? I mean it, you could say it looked like him as well for sure yeah. and that, and yeah. that was the, the you know like a, a weird place to be I mean it was an unusual choice I would say to Put the name of a real person in a script. Mm -hmm. Not was, looking at you, Andy. Not yeah, really, was no. <laughs> it was uh, John Eves, but he had, a, he had a that was his first name, effectively. So he had John Eves Gil Gilmore or something. Um, but obviously, you know, they had enough evidence to kind of. But the really strange thing is that Pete Duncan, um, who's doing those levels, he designed out the uh, John Eves's office. Mm. Um, it just and as you say, he made it out of kind of stock um, uh, static objects. Um, and uh, and it looks exactly like John, John Eves' office, so that was also used in the court case because he somehow made exactly the same office with the bookcase in the same place, the seat in the same place. I don't know whether he, you know, subconsciously seen the picture, but um, so yeah, that that caused a few issues. So, um, yeah. 
So it was a payoff for Jean Yves okay. of £62 million. <laughs> <laughs> I just it made that number up. Yeah, you just made that number up. I think what it, what it came down to was um, under French law, you can copyright your, your identity oh. and your name or something like that. So it meant that within France, he had a legal case, but not the rest of the world. And I think a lot of it was slowly ticked off as like, this doesn't count or this doesn't count. And because we had a lot of evidence for where our reference came from that wasn't, wasn't him. But yeah, it was a, there were certainly some exciting meetings with lawyers that, uh, that made me uh, a better game developer later on. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So yeah. So I think, when like, so you're in the weeds of developing something like Tomb Raider for weeks and months on end, you're looking at the enemies, you're looking at the levels, the FMVs. But when eventually can you kind of see like the projects where it's like set to music or it's set to the voice acting, where it's like Janelle, where it's Pete? Did like a certain scene perhaps maybe like stick out to each of you when you kind of like heard that for the first time? Was that kind of a moment for you when you thought it was all coming together and you thought, wow, this is like you know, it's a highlight for me through Tomb Raider 4. Yeah, I don't remember at which point you did the, um, the actual line of death, but I do remember I, I did shed a tear at the, um, it, you know, it, for some reason it was just, I think we were all quite stressed as usual. But um, I, don't, I don't think that was, that was that quite early on, the death sequence? It was very much at the end. It was oh, Dave, was, it? Dave okay. was actually doing that one. Oh, right, okay. Oh, yeah, I remember Dave. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, no, that's quite emotional for me. Yeah, the, yeah. But I mean, we probably all had some emotions at that sequence, but um, I can't think other than that. But, you know, as the F&B boss, you must have some that you particularly yeah. want. I think the, the Jeep sort of chase thing mm. with the jump and things, because it just was classic Tomb Raider and classic Indiana Jones, and yeah. it had action, but it had some storytelling as well. And, it, and like anything that I did, it had animals in it. Yeah. So... Uh, but I think I, I kind of quite like the Lara being sealed in the tomb at Karnak as well. It was the yeah. start of Jamie's level, I think. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. I think with you, Tom, I mean, you know, like the enemies are just amazing, like, especially the skeletons as well. You know, um, I mean, that must have been like an amazing thing, kind of like see them like jump over, like, you know, platform to platform, because enemies couldn't do that before in Tomb Raider, so that must have been a moment too. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, probably I am, I am very fond of the skeletons. They were really, I spent a long time. They were the, they were the kind of the test bed that I used. So, um, yeah, a lot of the photos that exist from around that time, I've always got the skeletons on my monitors on the test level, <laughs> jumping from, from level to level. But again, uh, just shout out to Phil Chapman, because, I mean, again, I would think, I would basically um, work something out and I'd kind of go, Phil, can we have this skeleton running around without a head? Or can we have a jump? And him for a skeleton, and being Phil, being Phil, would it would be done like two hours later or something ridiculous because he's like an animating machine. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it was really it was, I would just get s very small nerdy anecdote. I mean, and I've told it before, I think, so apologies in advance if you heard this one before, but basically, um, there was there's so little memory on the on so a lot of the things we talk about, the limitations, stuff like that, it's just yeah. it's a PlayStation, everything had to work on a PlayStation One. It's just by, I, mean, it's, I realized the other day, especially the amount of memory on the PlayStation 1 was less than one photo on, on your mobile. Um, so it's basically two meg of memory. Everything has to fit in that. Um, everything has to fit in that or for, you know, for a level that's playing. So basically the, the AI structure, there was just no room to do anything new until I found, I found one, one spare bit, not a byte even, one spare bit in the data structure for how the links were encoded, and that meant I could encode something that was a jump link rather than a normal link between the boxes, which meant that we could have jumping enemies. So that kind of, you know, get working that out and that working through, and just the first time that we actually had a level with skeletons running after Lara and chasing, jumping, because again, as, an, as a Tomb Raider player, I knew that the thing that would really surprise you is when you would run away from something, be in what you thought was a safe place, and suddenly everything jumps across the gap and is right on your ass. So, you know, that was a, a really big moment for me. So that was, uh, yeah, I was very, very happy about, about them. Brilliant. No, brilliant. <coughs> and I think of Tomb Raider 4 as well. I mean, it's such an upgrade in everything it has. I mean, the looks, even the inventory screen, how you can combine items, the FMVs, the enemies, everything. I mean, but all done in 10 months, like, again. I mean, did this feel kind of like more intense, like, compared to developing Tomb Raider 3 to get it over that finish line in 99? 
I think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think um, Tomb Raider 3, we were trying to put everything in the kitchen sink in it to prove that we, uh, that we could develop a kind of outstanding Tomb Raider game. Um, Tomb Raider 4, we were quite confident in what we, the, we knew the team, we knew what we were all capable of. Um, you know, we all went to each other to ask, you know, for instance, you know, I think Pete told us that we had to rein in our cutscenes to some degree um, so that we knew exactly the amount of work we had to do. I mean, I don't remember, it was the, it's the usual nightmare. I, mean, I remember we sort of pissed about for two months, um, then worked like maniacs, crunched for, you know, eight, eight months. Um, but, but yeah, no, I don't remember it being any different. Uh, I think it was a bit more professional. As in, I think we were better. All right. Yeah. We were better organised at planning and what we were trying to do, I think. I think you were. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think the other thing is that we kind of like Tomb Raider, for me at least, I can't speak, speak for the rest of the coders, but Tomb Raider 3 was a learning experience and just kind of learning how Tomb Raider worked and fitted together. So a lot of the time, was just kind of learning how everything worked with Tomb Raider 3. And obviously, when we came to Tomb Raider 4, we had that experience behind us and we knew based how most stuff worked. So it was just making, trying to make stuff better mm -hmm. for, for that, sec that time, second time around. Amazing. And one of the reasons I asked that as well is the fact that, I don't know if anyone's seen this, but there's a show in late night called Bits. It was a video game show on Channel 4. And they did a whole episode about Tomb Raider 4. Mm -hmm. And they went to the offices. And it's a... It's an interesting snapshot, really, into how intense it seems, you know, on the cameras and stuff. I don't suppose, like, even you, like, remember um, the team coming in for this show. Yeah, yeah, I remember them, yeah. I, I remember them coming in, yeah. Um, they were really keen, and they were really... Um, the Canadian girl was... Um, she was really... She obviously played Tomb Raider, and they're big fans, so it was really nice. Um, you know, I think we chatted with them, but as usual, we were kind of up against the wire. I think Tom might have a story to tell about this. Are you allowed to tell the story? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not even sure. I'm not sure if it's them or another camera crew. It might have been them, but basically, them, yeah. uh, uh, it, during Tomb Raider four, um, my son was born. So we basically, towards the end, he was about five months old. I'd, I'd barely seen him just because of working late and everything like that, and getting home after midnight most nights. So it was. I was on the phone to my partner, telling her that yet yeah, again I probably wouldn't make it home that night, and um, you know it was kind of feeling quite emotional and I kind of looked up from this phone call still on the on the phone to her and realized that they had a camera in my face and was actually filming the the phone call and I was absolutely fucking furious and it's <laughs> genuinely just going what are you are you filming this you and they were like oh, oh, faces, oh sorry mate oh sorry yeah. smashed all the faces in smashed all the faces in. Yeah, no I just <laughs> I just filmed that but it was it again it was like I don't know they just seem to have this habit of always inviting people we always seem to be doing those sort of uh you know, sort of like television stuff or um, promotional stuff, just always like the day before a deadline or just when we were just always in, in the middle I of it. I remember Nell McAndrew coming around um, on one of the Tomb Raider yeah. models, you know, the full Tomb Raider gear and they brought Nell into the room. And that, uh, by all accounts, Nell was really nice. Um, but we were in, to, we had to deliver some sort of deadline and she was like, hello everybody, and we, we were all up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> lovely, you know, I didn't give them the time of day, and it's like, we, we, we were just so busy, we never even really noticed when they were, the only time I do remember is when the lady brought me in the, um, uh, the embroidered um, Lara picture. Was it embroidered, what was it? I remember that, I think that it might have been a Tomb, tomb Raider 5, but yeah, a, a couple brought Yeah. Um, embroidered to two made a picture that they made. Yeah, so I, I was nominated to be the re recipient of the um, embroidered Lara mm. picture. And it was very nice, but it was a bit kind of What's embarrassing. It? It's like, what, we just didn't know kind of what to Could say. Could have got that sign today and put it on <laughs> eBay. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That was great, that was great. So, Two Minute Four came out, and great reception as always. And now, 25 years later, it's getting a remaster. <laughs> what? <laughs> We, sh we should probably each get about a million pounds royalties out of that. Yes. <laughs> I believe. Yeah. So I think the first question is, is like, you know, what reach your thoughts on this? Um, and is there anything you'd like to see improved or changed for this remastering for? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, it's really hard to say. I mean, it's. I think my experience of playing it, and as a game developer, you play a game in a broken order anyway. You'll play bits of the game when it's available to play, so you 
your kind of experience is just tainted and you don't really get that. Mm. But I think when I did try and play it, to get to the bits that I did, obviously selfishly, um, yeah, it was probably some of the backtracking was mainly just because it's just like, actually, I'm, I'm just doing a lot of walking and it's just taking a lot of my time. But, but again, I think you'd, you'd be breaking the structure of the game. So that's that's a very personal change that maybe no one ever else wants. You may change my card then. <laughs> no, it's changing this one. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. I still haven't played the last remaster, um, so I don't quite quite know what to say. I'd quite like to see how they handle the controls, because I mean, I feel like it would be weird playing Tomb Raider with different controls. But I also feel that for a modern gamer, going back to Tomb Raider controls would feel quite clunky. So you can choose to you can switch you can choose, between yeah, yeah, I know. Like, but are they good? Or well, no, I'm <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, if someone can send us a copy that would be grand. <laughs> so we don't get a copy of the game that effectively we made, but um, but I mean uh, yeah, I don't think we're, we're bitter. It's just a bit weird that you know it's like somebody getting yeah. a book you've written and then rewriting it um, with a new glossy cover and you don't get any we don't yeah. want money out of it, we just kind of want some recognition, really, you know. And it's nice that the game gets preserved, though. Yeah. Because obviously there'll come a point where games just stop working and yeah. old consoles yeah. stop working, so that's good. I mean, in terms of, like, modern live games, you know, you're, there's no box product anymore that you own, so the moment the server's turned off, the game disappears, which I've experienced. And um, I just think, yeah, it's nice that a game can have a longer life for more people to enjoy. Yeah, yeah. no one did the yeah. So yeah, so I think we'll um, end it there. So thank you three so much for this. It's been great. Thank you so much.